Let's go. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Mika, and you're watching the Red Cup Podcast, where truth, pop culture, and politics meet. What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Mika, and we're back for another Red Cup Talks because y'all know when we got the Red Cup, we're about to spill some truth. So happy Wednesday. Thank you all for coming, like, comment, and subscribe. So today I wanted to get into a trending topic, but you know how I am. I like to look at it from a different angle. So everyone knows what's happening with the whole Janet Jackson and Kamala thing, right? Janet Jackson gave an interview. She said she didn't think Kamala was black and it blew up from there, right? So I want to get into the implications, like what all of this stuff actually means and why we even care so much in American society about race. So let's get into it. You know what time it is. It's time for shots. So here's my shot. Race is a social construct. Okay. It has nothing to do with DNA. Absolutely nothing. You can be more of one thing or the other if you're a mixed race person, okay? And again, it doesn't matter, right? There's a difference between genotype and phenotype. Phenotype is what you look like, all right? And as a mixed race person, you can look more like one or the other. Doesn't matter. It still doesn't change your DNA, but we'll get there. In society today, race is a way to have economic power. It's a way to have social class. It's a way to label yourself and be aligned to get ahead. There's all types of advantages with it. So what I want to focus on today is the Kamala topic, but the Kamala topic from the point of, well, what does it mean? Why is it so important? And what it means for Kamala to be in the spaces that she's in, okay? The black space, the black female space, which is so complicated. One, because we're women. But two, it's complicated because if Kamala is indeed, and I have my thoughts and my feelings, but we're not talking about that right now. But if Kamala is indeed a black woman with maybe and possibly only a black parent, one black parent, then what does it mean to put that same woman in spaces with a woman who is black with two black parents, grew up traditionally black American or foundational black American, okay? And grew up in the culture and having everything that comes with being a black woman, okay? Those are totally different things. Those are those have totally different implications and it can have different outcomes financially, family wise and a whole host of other things. So I really wanted to explore that and get into that because I think the Kamala topic brings that to the forefront. OK, anytime there's a trending topic, I always try to focus on those implications. So now. What does that mean? That means, you know, we have to find out how it plays out in society, in pop culture. So, you know what time it is. It's time for pop and politics. Let's go. All right. So today in pop and politics, I wanted to focus on the singer Tyler. So Tyler had a bit of controversy here this year in America when she came to the States to promote her album. So I want to get into that as well. Here we go. Peace. Meet Tyler. How do I know that her name is Tyler? Because hey, it's Tyler. That's how she self-identifies. Among many other wonderful things, Tyler is a South African colored woman. Not black, not biracial, colored. That's colored in South Africa and colored here in the United States, despite the fact that many Black Americans don't want to call Tyler colored because of our own negative association with the term colored during segregation. But you see, South Africa had their own segregation called apartheid. Apartheid was a white supremacist power structure. And in the context of white hegemony, there are certain social privileges that come along with proximity to whiteness. While colored South Africans are generationally mixed, one can be colored in South Africa without being the child of an interracial couple. So you see, if Tyler were to kowtow to the 
sensibilities of black Americans and refer to herself around the world as a black woman, she would run the risk of offending black South Africans who know and have experienced the difference between being black and colored in South Africa. Remember that. So what he's saying right there is mixed women from South Africa and even in America, but we're going to talk about Tyler. She runs the the risk of having uh, issues because she is mixed. And in South Africa, the black people there, black people in Africa understand blackness. And so they are not going to put Tyler as a black woman because they understand what comes with it. They understand what she hasn't gone through, what her family is, what her family isn't. And just tying her to being black just because doesn't work. So that was part of that implication. But because that is different from America, America's Americans couldn't understand it. And so they had an issue with her calling herself colored race itself is a social construct. And there are many societies around the world. Are Dominicans Black? Are Panamanians Black? Are Indigenous Australians Black? Are Somalians Black or Egyptians? Are Eritreans Seychellois Black? These are all questions that are often debated, but the answer all depends on which colonial context you subscribe to. Because ironically, you know who's not Black? Black people. Because it was Dwight Mann who invented race in the first place and quite literally branded us these labels. Relax and remember, we all we got. We all so I like how he broke that down and again talked about how race is a social construct, right? It's not a real thing because it doesn't have anything to do with your DNA. But again, because we live in a society, people are going to label themselves and put them in those places. So it depends on how you subscribe. But that was a perfect uh, description. And he gave a great understanding of why Tyler talks the way she does, because she understands that mixed and black are not the same thing. In America, it gets thrown in there because of the history, but we'll get there. Let's move on to the next point. This video here just explains in one minute, really quick, what the one drop rule really is, because a lot of people talk about it, but they don't really have an understanding of what the one drop rule is. So this is one minute of what the one drop rule is, because I really want you guys to understand this before we get into Kamala Harris and everything that comes with that in race. Here we go. Until very recently, any person with one drop of black blood was black. In America's beginning, there was race mixing, especially among indentured servants and slaves. In 1676... So just really quick, indentured servants were a real thing. And those tend to be white people, right? Remember, this is under the British rule, and the British were like seen as the cream of the crop when it came to Europeans. So at the time, it was just called Europeans, and everybody associated themselves by where they came from. So even white people is what we call what we call it now or here in America. Even Europeans had their own hierarchy, OK, amongst themselves. All right. So white wasn't a thing. So you had like your Irish and all of that. You had them as indentured servants and other, you know, um, ethnic groups in Europe. So that's who they're talking about. Those people and a lot of the slaves and even some of the freedmen, because there were a lot of free black people. Don't let them tell you that all of them were slaves, but there were a lot of free black people. But a lot of these people mixed and so that created a whole class so mixing and their offspring were not slaves at up until a certain point so they had economic wealth that rivaled white people okay here we go during bacon's rebellion these blacks and whites fought the white ruling class holding them in bondage and lost 
To prevent future rebellions, the ruling class introduced one of the earliest variations of the one drop of black blood rule, transforming a class-based society into a race-based society. The purpose of the rule was to dis to make clear distinctions between black people and white people. So, well, I may not ever be on the bottom down there with you because I'll never be a black person, but I can certainly have some sort of prestige or social status psychologically for being white. Okay, so now you have white people that were the ruling class of Europeans saying, okay, we can't have, we can't have these people rebelling against us. It had nothing to do with DNA and it has nothing to do with anything else but economics. So we can't have them rebelling against us and uh, lose our, our way of life. So let's create something that keeps them separate. And that's when the whole white or black thing came. You give one a little more and tell them that they're this and you give the other nothing. And so one group gets to be over. It's really class by skin color. It, that, that's all it is, you know, first class, second class, third class, low class, all of that. That's what the whole racial hierarchy in America really is. Interracial unions were outlawed. Those with a drop of black blood were pushed into the black. This one drop rule defined slavery and entrenched the laws of segregation until the civil rights movement destroyed those laws but not the one drop rule, which reinvented itself into the five primary race boxes used by identity politics in its quest for racial justice. And who uses identity politics today? Those daggone Democrats. They use identity politics to have you, again, filling in little boxes, filling in this to identify yourself. That way they can do the same thing that they did to the indentured servants and the slaves then, okay? separate. So if you identify with this and you identify with that, then you're never going to see yourselves as Americans, right? Because at the end of the day, you're different. So why come together and rebel? So now it's time to get into it. So if Kamala Harris is indeed Indian, which is Asian, and Jamaican, which they're using Jamaican as the catalyst of being black. If she is indeed those things, right, then that would make her a mixed race woman. And being mixed race, again, has its own implications. But when we come to the political circuit, right, being mixed race has political implications because when you grow up a certain way, you're going to react a certain way to certain things. You're going to do certain things for certain people. You're going to do certain things with certain groups. And the reason why it matters so much with Kamala Harris is Kamala Harris's record has been doing things for the Asian American. Okay. Which makes sense because she grew up with her mother. All right. Her mother and her father split when she was about five. All right. So from five into her formative years, she is raised as a Indian woman because she's raised with that parent. OK, a Indian woman cannot raise a black woman. She does not know anything about being black. There's no way. Vice versa. OK. You could not give a, if you were a black woman, you could not give your child Indian culture. You do not know anything about being Indian. So the, the idea that her mother knew about raising black women is just asinine. But with that being said, that was the culture that she was raised in. All of her pictures have her in Indian garb. All of her pictures have her representing her South Asian roots. And it makes sense. That's perfectly fine. The reason why Kamala Harris does what she does is because she identifies a certain way, but she can identify another way because she's mixed race and she can use that to her political advantage. These are the games that the political oligarchy will play. All right. So I wanted to play a video here with 
a group of mixed people talking to MSNBC. All right, you have Trump supporters, you have uh, Kamala Harris supporters, and then you have independents undecided, right? And you're gonna see how they talk about, you know, the current events with Trump talking about Kamala Harris and her blackness. You're gonna see mixed race people on all sides of the spectrum talk about it. Here we go. Recently for political purposes, mm -hmm. questioning a core part of your identity. Yeah. Any same old tired playbook. Next question, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Vice President Kamala Harris in her first TV interview since becoming the Democratic nominee, quickly brushing off Donald Trump's comments on her racial identity. As the vice president hits the campaign trail, there is a growing focus on a group of voters that doesn't usually get recognized as a political demographic that is mixed race voters, people of two or more races. Joining us now, NBC News correspondent and co-anchor of NBC News Daily, Morgan Radford. She sat down with a group of mixed race and multi-ethnic voters to get their take on this election. Morgan, it is great to see you. What did they tell you? Hey there, Willie. Good morning. Look, this was a fascinating conversation, just to say the least. We talked to six people across a range of different racial, ethnic and political backgrounds in my home state, the swing state. Of morning. Look, this was a fascinating conversation, just to say the least. We talked to six people across a range of different racial, ethnic, and political backgrounds in my home state, the swing state of North Carolina. And many of them said that, look, the census forms and the boxes on polls, they give them pause, sometimes even panic because of the choices that those boxes force them to make. But even though they said those boxes are getting better and a little bit more inclusive over time, people's perceptions politically can still be pretty narrow. Take a look. Mm -hmm. I identify as Indian American and white. Hispanic, Asian. They're the face of a changing nation. When anybody asks, I just say I'm black and Puerto Rican. All my grandparents are from a different ethnic background. Multiracial Americans are now the fastest growing racial or ethnic group in the country over the last decade. And their voting power will be significant. In six battleground states, the population with two or more races has surged by more than 200% including here in North Carolina's Mecklenburg County. Can you raise your hand if you are a Republican, Democrat, Independent? Does the way that you identify racially impact your politics or specifically how you plan to vote this election? Absolutely. Now, this was an interesting question because you saw all of them, even though everyone has different political views, you saw all of them shake their head, okay? And the reason why all of them are shaking their head was because of what I just said earlier. How you grow up and who you grow up with shapes your identity. So it doesn't matter if you wanna put some people in the black box, some people in the white box, Indian box, Hispanic box, whatever. How they grow up shapes their identity, okay? What parent they grow up with, the grandparents, whoever, that shapes their identity. And all of that, well, you, they're gonna consider you this, they're gonna, that is not going to matter. That's not gonna change how they vote. That's not gonna change how they think. That's not gonna change how they see themselves, so. How so? I'm not gonna lend my support behind someone who does not support people who look like me. I don't think he sees me as a who I am. Former President Donald Trump. Yes. And what about the rest of you? I just don't think that Kamala Harris has anything vested in the air finger quote, black or Hispanic experience in so much as it would be identified by anybody that lives in those communities. You're saying you don't think that she can help black or brown people? No, I mean, going to Howard don't make you black. A conversation that quickly turned to this moment in a July interview at the National Association of Black Journalists. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black and now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know. Is she Indian or is she black? What did you think when you heard those comments? Highly offensive. I mean, I think 
probably every multiracial, mixed race, biracial person has had the experience of someone else telling them that they are not something enough. I think it, it's kind of triggering, right? I think it is impossible to be biracial in America. And I think that mm. it requires that you're covering all bases at all times. And um, it requires constant recognition of both identities. And I think when Donald Trump. I completely agree with what he just said. And the reason why I agree, if you don't know, I am a mixed race woman. So I completely agree with what he just said. It's it's constant. You know, if you don't say this, you don't say that, you don't say this. Everybody has a problem. Everybody. Um, says stuff like that about uh, Kamala Harris and implies that she's like picking a race for political advantage. It's tapping into an incredibly familiar sentiment mm -hmm. that I think everyone on this panel can understand. Lamarie and Adul, mm -hmm. as Trump supporters, when you heard that comment as mixed people, how did it register with you? Well, my first thought was oh, that wasn't very well thought out. At the same time, though, when I heard it, I didn't hear it as an attack on blacks or Indians. I heard it more so of him commenting towards identity politics and the appeal that some take to play up one side of their race over the other. Adul, I see you nodding your head. I agree with him. I didn't know that I didn't know she identified as black because everything I saw was first South Asian, first Indian. There's none of that identified as black. Regar now, of course, this is MSNBC, so they are left leaning. So, you know, they're going to fight for their girl, which is fine, whatever. Um, but they both make a valid point. The point is that that is identity politics, okay? Yes, she got sworn in as senator, as the first South Asian, okay? She didn't say, and black. She said, my South Asian roots, my South Asian, South Asian, South Asian, South Asian, South Asian, okay? So he is absolutely right, South Asian is what she kept saying. The same thing when she got sworn in with her mother there as uh, the attorney general. It was the same thing. She talked about being Asian. So it didn't really come up until she started running for president, right? She wrote that book right before. If you look at the dates, she wrote it right before she went into going into being uh, a presidential candidate back in 2019. So it's right on time, it's just enough. And she has other things that are a problem, but w just to focus on this, I see what they're saying. But you know, MSNBC is gonna curve it. Regardless of her parents, I mean, she was born in this country and she identifies as a black person in this country in an American way, in a I've uniquely American context. I've never heard her identify herself as a black woman. Yeah, she said she multiple does. times she's a black woman. I've so. never heard it. But I'm black. Yes. And I'm proud of being black. Politics sometimes becoming. And they use the Breakfast Club clip, which her father had an issue with. Her own father had an issue with her one saying that Jamaican people, of course she, of course she smoked weed before because she's Jamaican, right? Her father had an issue with that. And two, her father said, I don't know why she's doing identity politics. And I don't know why she keeps saying that she's black because I am Hindu and Irish, but we'll get there. Personal this year with mixed race Americans having representation on both tickets. I don't agree with anything J.D. Vance has to say. I mean, almost nothing. But um, I think it's incredible that we've gotten to a point where the vice president of the United States can have a wife named Usha Chilakari mm -hmm. and a son named Vivek. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I won't vote against him in November. Even though you disagree with mm -hmm. Kamala Harris politically, do you feel some kinship towards her as a mixed person? Not personally. I find a lot of her trajectory to not be my brand of woman, leader. We've got three major international crises going on and someone applying to be commander in chief. As a woman, I want to see you do more than, you know, appeal to giggling and having a girl moment on the stage. Was there ever a moment that sort of forced you to confront the concept of race? For me, it's more about ethnicity. As you guys can see, I have an accent, right? And I speak with an accent. I don't think with an accent.
you just learn to. Be- and that that that's a good point that he brought up because. Um, a lot of people don't understand the difference between race and ethnicity, right? And that's the, why I don't like the whole, well, her father is Jamaican. Jamaican does not mean black. Jamaica is a nationality where you come from, okay? Your ethnicity is your culture. So that's why in the Hispanic community, you hear a lot of the times, um, whether it, like with Dominicans, Dominicans can be white, Dominicans can be black, Dominicans can be mixed, okay? And a lot of the times, if you see, a Dominican of whatever race, you will you will see them just say Dominican. They won't say black. They won't say white. They they just Dominican. Same with uh, my family. My family is from Cuba. Well, my dad's family is from Cuba, so they will just say Cuban because a lot of the times and before race was introduced, you know, as a social construct, you will say your nationality. And, and your ethnicity, because that is your culture. That is your culture, okay? Not race. To be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. A conversation with implications beyond the ballot box. I think mm-hmm. every time we see polling, it's about race. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, as a candidate of color, you put a lot of uh, stake into how this candidate represents say, the Black experience or the Indian American experience. I think we will never ask Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Bill Clinton or George Bush to do the same thing. I think Mm -hmm. white people are expected and uh, people of color aren't. To do what? To be in the highest office in the United States. So he's also um, Native American. So my mother is Native American and Polish. And um, the thing about that is a lot of people, you know, will just dismiss all of that when you are mixed race. They dismiss everything else. And I grew up with my grandparents. So if you grow up in all of that, you don't dismiss it because that is a part of you. Right. So essentially. What these people are saying, even though they all have different political views, they all have the mindset of. They represent all that they are. They aren't just one thing here in America, and that can be very frustrating, but they also are saying that. They don't do identity politics because they have multiple identities. So they want to know what works for their identities and their their ethnicities, not just the identity. But we're going to move on. So I saw this video and I wanted to go ahead and get into this video because I thought it was one interesting because Candace Owens decides that with all the Janet hoopla that's been going on, as she read the article, she decides to go ahead and look up Kamala Harris's family tree. OK, she decides to look up her ancestry to really actually investigate. Right. We know we know all the names. So you can go look up census. You can go look up. Uh, pretty much anything at this point. So she decided to actually go do that because she knew the names of the family members. And, it, you know, it's it's pretty much out there. And her father has already given a lot of gems. Right. He he doesn't speak to his daughter because he says she plays um political games with her race and it's for politics and he doesn't like it. Right. So with all that went on with Janet and how black people came for Janet, how black people talked about Janet, how D.L. Hughley had the nerve to literally destroy Janet and how she looks and uh, make a mockery of her, you know, Michael Jackson and and the rest of the brothers all for Kamala Harris was was. It, it was downright disgusting, but it it showed something else. So I'm going to get into this and then we'll come back and talk about everything. Here we go. 
On the Rhythm Nation Nation album, for us, it was about making a difference in a kid's life, a teenager's life, from them taking this path with drugs and going down the wrong street to trying to make something of themselves. On that record, she sang about joining voices in protest to social injustice and pushing toward a world rid of color lines. I wonder where she stands in the forthcoming election. After all, I say, America could be on the verge of voting its first black female president, Kamala Harris. This is Janet Jackson. Well, you know what they said, supposedly, she asked me. She's not black. That's what I heard, that she's Indian. She looks at me expectantly, perhaps assuming that I have Indian heritage. Well, she's both, I offer. Her father's white, Janet says. That's what I was told. I mean, I haven't watched the news in a few days. I was told they discovered her father was white. The journalist writes, I'm floored at this point. It is well known that Harris's father is a Jamaican economist, a Stanford professor who split from her Indian mother when she was five. Okay. So <laughs> this journalist is obviously not a journalist. This person is an activist. They were correct. Because why are you even asking Janet all of that? She's there to talk about her music. She's there to talk about her tour and things like that. And she's an entertainer. I don't understand why y'all keep looking to entertainers for this nonsense, especially when it comes to the black community. Malcolm X said it best. No other community makes the entertainer number one, the, the, the intellectual. So take that as you will were sent to do this interview for a reason, sent to write this profile piece and make it look like Jenna is crazy. And of course, sent to get the quotation she expected, which was that it's going to be amazing to have a black woman as president, because again, they're signaling to black people, get into line. This is your new Obama, despite any evidence that she is black. And so I actually thought, has anybody really investigated Kamala Harris's genealogy? Like we just keep being told she's black suddenly and the media keeps overreacting when people say she's not black. And I can't find any evidence that Kamala Harris is black. So I said, I'm going to pause everything and do a deep dive on Kamala Harris's genealogy. And what I discovered is so shocking. Okay. So first let's start with just Kamala Harris's birth certificate. This is it. This is an authentic copy of it. It's already been discussed. Mm -hmm. um, you can see in the corner that we have highlighted on her mother is her mother's name is an Indian name, Shailamala Gopalan. And under color or race of mother, her mother has put Caucasian, extremely controversial, but we don't need to, we don't need to focus on the mother because the, the mother put Caucasian because uh, Indians have a class system. And so she's under the, I'm sorry, not class, caste system. And so she's under the caste that is Caucasian. Okay. The mother everyone accepts the mother is not black at all, right? So if she's some part Caucasian, majority Indian, everyone ex ex accepts that the mother is not the claim to her black heritage, it is the father. On the bottom there, you can see that it says that her father's name is Donald Jasper Harris and that the color or the race of the father is listed as Jamaican, okay? So you can be Jamaican, you can grow up in Jamaica and not be black, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's like Elon Musk, like he was born and raised in Africa, it would be absurd for Elon Musk to say that he was black because he is not black. He is a white African. So I wanted to go further into Donald Jasper Harris, allegedly born in Jamaica in 1938. Um, so who are his parents? Okay. So this is Kamala's dad, Donald Harris. We're looking now into Kamala's grandparents. The grandparents' names are Beryl Christie Finnegan Harris and Oscar Joseph Brown Harris. So let's start with Beryl. Let's start with her grandmother. This is an alleged photo of Beryl Christie Harris, okay? It is... This is where it gets weird, but good, because Candace is good. She dug, like, <laughs> she's good. This is where it gets good. The only one that exists in the public domain, and I want you guys to know that it was presented by Kamala herself. I looked at it and I was like, oh, okay, like, where did this photo come from? Actually, Kamala is the one that entered this into the public domain in her book, which is entitled The Truths We Hold, which was published in 2019. So let's looking at this woman, she looks black. And remember, I said earlier when we were talking about the mixed people in, in, on MSNBC, I said Kamala Harris put that book out right before her presidential run. Go figure that she had to put the blackness right before she goes and campaigns as a Democrat to be president. Black, and she wrote, visiting my paternal grandmother, Beryl, in Jamaica. Okay. Now, 
when I saw this, I assumed it was a fake photo and I assumed that somebody had put it up other than Kamala because just doing a very brief search and then I triple, quadruple checked this across multiple websites, genealogy websites and genealogists, that can't be Kamala's grandmother. Just pull up a picture of her again. Come on, Candace. That can't be Kamala's grandmother because at least according to my research, Grandma Beryl died before Kamala was born. And now I want... Y'all know what this means, right? This means, okay, that Kamala Harris put up a picture of a woman who is not her grandmother because by records, okay, records don't lie, numbers don't lie, okay, she died 1960. Candace, tell us when Kamala was born. Please tell us when Kamala was born. The internet to fact check this with me. This is wild, okay? Beryl was born in 1921 and she died in 1960. Okay, I've checked grave sites everywhere. This is the, I mean, it's not exactly a very common name and not an exactly very common place, specifically where she was born, St. Anne's Parish in Jamaica. That would mean that Beryl had Kamala's father when she was just 17 years old in 1938, and she died when she was just 39 years old. The black woman in that photo is not 39 years old. <laughs> so this is a major discrepancy, okay? And I, this is just a tiny bit of digging. I went, wait a second. Does anybody realize that like Beryl allegedly died when she was 39 years old in 1960? That means that Kamala would have been born four years after her grandmother died in 1964. Do you see what I'm saying? So for all of you with this whole, she has integrity. What is this? What is this? Forget the race of it all. Like, <laughs> why are you lying about your grandma? Like, why? And then on top of that, you put up a picture that is easily like you can just do the research. It makes no sense. 64 is when Kamala was born. Her grandmother died in 1960. So who is that woman that is in the photo with Kamala? OK, Beryl Finnegan, now that's looking more into her grandmother, uh, was definitively not black. Now, how do we know this? Because Beryl, that woman that you just saw, her father was Patrick Al Alhanasus Finnegan, who was an Irish slaver. Now, what about Kamala's grandfather? The other side of this, Oscar Joseph Brown Harris is his name. That's allegedly who Beryl married, right? Okay. What I've learned about him, this is the photo that um, they have produced of him. That's supposed to be her grandfather. What I've learned about Oscar was that he was born in 1914. Brown was his mother's maiden name. His mother was a woman named Christiana Brown, who was known as Miss Chrissy. Christiana Brown's father was also a white Irish slave trader named Colonel Hamilton Brown. That is the white Irish slave trader named Colonel Candace did child look at this look at this this is a Irish slave owner that's what this is so when I, I look at all this I'm like ma'am how where, where is the black because this is public record right she can say whatever she wants. This is on public record before she was ever even thought about. So these people that Candace are talking is talking about, these people are real. Nobody cares what race you are to run for president. But it's not trivial when you're running on a race, when you're playing identity politics. Brown. He married an indentured servant, an Irish woman named Kate Williams, presumably Catherine Williams. And let me tell you how wealthy her family was. Colonel Hamilton established the town that they lived in. It was called Hamilton Town. It's now called Brown Town. And he owned, at a minimum, 
1,120 slaves, according to records, okay? So they were a family of wealthy Irish slave traders. Let's go back again to that photo of the barrel, who's definitely not barrel, okay? And let's go forward here so you guys can get this in your head. That's the That looks like the same woman to me, okay? But this woman is allegedly her great-grandmother, who is known as Miss Iris, okay? So pull up Miss Iris again, the great-grandmother who Kamala is allegedly on her lap. We can all agree that that woman looks to be at least some percentage black, and mm -hmm. it's about to get weird, okay? So first, just mm -hmm. so we are clear, even if this woman was 100% black, that would make Kamala majority Irish white. It would, she would be one, like majority white. So it's completely crazy that she would suddenly claw out and pretend that she's black, okay? If she was 100% that woman, great grandmother, if she was 100% black, that would make Kamala 12% black under a best case scenario. But I so there has never been someone that anybody will consider a race based off their great great grandmother or their great great grandfather right N nobody tom joiner's great great grandfather is a white man when he did his ancestry with pbs and tom joiner's mom Every, everybody has black parents just way in the back he has one white person nobody considers him white so now we're supposed to consider people black because possibly at best maybe if this lady is the great great grandmother kamala is black so now 10%. If that is the case, shoot, you know how many white people are black? And y'all are not going to give it if y'all went and saw Donald Trump's genealogy, <laughs> ancestry, whatever. And he had a great, great, great black parent. And he said he was black. Yeah, child. But I thought, okay, that's Miss Iris. She's saying that's her great grandmother. Let me like verify that Miss Iris was fully black. And a way to do that would be to take a look at Miss Iris's children, you know? Um, now, to be clear, she allegedly had four children. So we have Kamala's missing grandmother, Beryl, who allegedly mm -hmm. died at the age of 39, as well as some of Kamala's great uncles and great aunts. And their names were Abraham Judah, Judah Finnegan, Noel Finnegan, and Bernard Finnegan, okay? So Beryl, the missing grandma, has three siblings, Abraham, Judah Finnegan, Noel Finnegan, and Bernard Finnegan. All of these people have apparently evaporated, evaporated into thin air. Literally cannot find a single trace of these people who definitely do not have black names, okay? And I'm just going, I, ju I just wanna see a picture here. So I'm gonna put a bounty on it. I would like someone to do a little bit of due diligence here, find Child, Candace didn't put a bounty on it. But look, this goes to a greater point. So let's come back and talk about the greater point. Here we go. Greater point is this. Candace found, <clears throat> excuse me, Candace found all of the relatives. And I do mean all of them. Now, she has to do some more digging to find out you know, the children's children and their parent and all this, all of this other stuff, right? But the thing about it is those that initial, the grandmother is not even the grandmother because the grandmother was dead. So when you look at all that, that is a photo that she put up when she was running for president, okay? Now, again, does it matter really? No, but she's running on identity politics and she's running as a black woman. Well, if you're gonna run as a black woman, by golly, you wouldn't need to be black, right? Well, this just proves what Donald Harris said. He said he is not black. He said he has Hindu and Irish, right? So that goes to show why the father doesn't really mess with her like that. So I want to say this with last call.
it's political. This whole thing is political. Whether you believe Kamala Harris is black or not, it's all a political play to get your votes. They're not going to do anything in particular that is going to set you ahead. It is a game. And it's sad that they play games with what people hold dear, their ethnicity, their race, their culture, right? You hold this dear and someone gets to play political warfare with it. They get to use it to their advantage. A lot of people are waking up to it. And in particular, a lot of black people are waking up to it. You, you appeal to the uh, emotion of that group. You appeal to certain things that you know have uh, generationally hurt that group, right? And you appeal to that. You perceive yourself as that just to get ahead. It's not right. It's not fair. And that is what the Democrats and Kamala Harris are doing right now. So everyone has a right to question their politicians. So if a black person wants to question Kamala Harris's blackness, so what? They're black. They can do that. Every other group would do that including the you-know-what group. Every other group would do that because this is a part of people's culture. It's not a negative. I want to know what you're going to do for me and my culture to get ahead. Otherwise, why am I voting for you? And that goes for Donald Trump or anybody, but Donald Trump is not using his race as a means to securing your vote. But mixed race, it's being politicized right now. It's political. And as a mixed race person, I can tell you, I don't care whether you're white, black, whatever. I don't care because if you're not coming with tangibles, you might as well not even ask for my vote because it's not happening. I don't vote emotionally. I vote logically. And that's where I'm going to leave it. So let me know in the comments, like, comment, and subscribe. Again, this all came down from Janet Jackson because she sparked it up again. And I love it because Janet is actually one of my, if yeah, it, between her and Tony Braxton, they're my favorite singers, okay? So I'm glad that, you know, she gave her opinion. I'm sad that people chose to roast her for giving a, uh, her, her thoughts on something that she was asked. She didn't even bring it up. But it's America. It's all politics. It's all political. All political. Like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts. It's your girl, Mika. And I'm out.